let's continue. But before diving deeper, uh, let's take a quick recap of what we have done so far. So, we looked at uh, how radio window is unique. Right, that's that's the, one of the first things that we try to uh, understand, and, and and also like it was interesting to see that how the development of India's strong in early days should be, especially like we put it in two different contexts. One is related to uh, the technical aspect of it, because as we saw that the development of a detection of radio signal is very different, right? Because in nature we are not allowed. Uh, the lens uh, as we have in optical wavelengths, at optical wavelengths that would actually do imaging for us. So at radio wavelengths, we have to use a combination of uh, mathematics and electronics to actually synthesize a lens. Right? This is what uh, we are doing there. Uh, what we are doing is that we are using a pair of, uh, sort of pair of antennas and sampling uh, electric field in the ground plane. If you define that, let's say, which colors you will be playing, you will be doing the antenna separation units of wavelength. And then we, we sample uh, electric field by using antenna in pairs. And then we do a Fourier transform of that. And that, so, so this entire whole operation, we can think of it as equivalent to synthesizing a lens. Right? This whole, whole thing actually represents what lens does naturally at optical wavelength. Right, or the lens in my eye is doing naturally. This is what it is doing. Exactly the same thing. But at uh, radio wavelengths, we don't have uh, an equivalent medium which would do it. it that's uh, the that, that's coming from how the EM is in fact with matter uh, differently at different uh, frequencies of wavelengths, right? It's just coming from that. So what instead we have done is that we have actually electronically synthesized the lens, right? And then the lens. Now, uh, we can make lenses as large as 10, 20, 30, even 100 kilometers, or even as large as the size of Earth. Like, if you would have followed uh, popular astronomy literature, then you would have also come across the aim of event horizon telescope. Like, last few years, it was making images of black hole. And then it's using exactly the same technique, but it requires very, very high resolution. So what they did was uh, they carried out these observations uh, using dishes, uh, which are actually uh, part of, of VLBI, a very long distance interferometry. In that, like the dishes are as like spread across continents, right? So in case of GMRT or VLA, what happens is that the signal is actually from each of these antenna are brought to uh, some kind of a central electronic station, and then it is actually then correlated. Like the correlation is the kind of complex correlation I talked about, which will give me complex visibility, amplitude and four phase. When these dishes are actually spread over continents, then it cannot be done in real time because we are getting samples every microseconds and we have to correlate, right? But otherwise, that phase information is lost. So the data rate is very, very high, right? So, so what is done in case of, an, of uh, like the event horizon telescope is that the data is collected with time stamping, and then it is brought uh, by plane. It's stored on this and brought uh, at a common location and then correlated. Like that, some of the correlation would take place in those cases. But uh, we can, but uh, what I want to tell is that the lens, we can, we can create a lens which is like hundreds of uh, kilometers. And then uh, this lens is then has got uh, some imp imperfections in it, right? Because uh, the <coughs> shape and the extent of the lens is represented here by the points at which we have made these measurements which are actually corresponding to these black points there right you can see so in the center actually it's much more densely filled and as we go out actually it gets faster and that is also easy to understand from simple geometry that because any sort of distribution of antennas i take there will be more number of shorter baseline than compared to longer baselines right it will happen, I and mean, there's nothing that I can do uh, some of these things, right? So that's, this is how like, it is always centrally concentrated, and then it's sort of a sparse there. Okay? And uh, so, so once we get that, so each of these points, at each of these points, we have actually uh, is 
complex resolutions, amplitude and phase both we have. And these visibilities are, are uh, so many of those visibilities actually are coming from the same antenna pair, but they are lying at a different location in this place. Right? Because the baseline or the projected baseline value has changed because of the source has moved in the sky. So aperture synthesis actually allows us to use the rotation of Earth to economically fill this UV plane. So since uh, I'm observing objects which are not changing during the observation, then I can observe these objects for like eight hours, 10 hours, something like that. So I can, from rise to set, something like that. And then I can fill this UV plane as much as possible using the internet that I have, distribution that I have. And once we have collected this, we make a Fourier transform of these, and then the, this very much the image that I get. And this image is then as real as what you, it's an optical means or with your mobile camera or with an optical camera, right? There's no difference. The only thing difference is, is that, like, for example, this is a radio image uh, of uh, an AGN. At the center, in, in the dark, uh, this thing is the uh, optical image. So this is a galaxy at the center. And this galaxy has a black hole. And it has, it's, a, it's an active galaxy. And it has its radio bright, which, in, in this case, we don't see clear jets. But it has ejected this huge amount of plasma in the outer regions, and you can see that like it sort of exists. It's, it's much more uh, extended than the galaxy itself, and it, it has been given red color in this case. But it is naturally at a certain frequency, 1.4 gigahertz in this case. Right, so the red color is like think of it as a false color, but it's otherwise it's real. Like it has got certain brightness, which we measure in the image of galaxies in this case, and then it has got some intensity and distribution and everything. It is as real as this. And another interesting thing to note is that like if we didn't have a radio image of this patch of the sky, we wouldn't even know that something like this is present here. Right? Because this whole part is seen only at radio images. So this is a very nice demonstration of, of how these things are complementary to each other. So and another thing that so, so we use a lot, a lot of Korean Right, we, we started with simple uh, idea of Fourier optics, which we have used uh, to understand interference and diffraction. Like multiple times, you would have done undergrad, postgrad, depending on your post structures, you would have certainly done it two or three times uh, in optics. Uh, but so that's the interference and diffraction part that comes from the Fourier optics. But then the same thing then can also be applied applied to imaging devices because they would naturally produce a diffraction and that then uh, will directly be related to the image quality that we have, isn't it? Because uh, that would introduce certain side lobes uh, and artifacts in my image. And uh, then there is always a challenge uh, to then design a telescope which will have excellent uh, uh, sensitivity and resolution also to minimize the artifacts that we could have, right? And, and in that case, uh, the idea would be to have an aperture which actually does not uh, abruptly stop at the edges. So just simple things like this, which very intuitively we can... Uh, uh, ...understand from the... Uh, uh, ...we are doing transforms to this period transform from the perspective of uh, like how they get applied certain systems. And what would be the behavior like this? Right? So, radio astronomy, there are two in radio interferometry, there are two places where we can actually uh, directly apply this. One is we have seen in the case of uh, single dish itself design, and then the, and, and now we are going to look at it uh, further that how it actually affects the imaging itself. Right, so, so one is that like the signal is coming, it's getting refracted, so that's uh, your telescope design is getting up, uh, is affecting the imaging properties there itself, starting with the resolution of it itself, right? So now, but second thing now we have to do is that we have to also carry out a Fourier transform here, right? To go from here to this end. Right? Now let us see how is this going to affect. So now we are talking about doing something uh, real in the data, data right? Like, uh, up to this point, you were talking about okay, okay, there's some maths and this, and this will happen, that will happen. That's all. 
But now we are also going to pay attention on uh, the real aspects of the data, the real limitations of it, the, and, and, and how, how to <laughs> tackle them. So whenever we are doing uh, something in uh, real world, uh, the two things that are going to happen in an experiment, one is that uh, I am interested in a certain signal, but the signal is actually uh, always modified by my instrument itself, right? Because uh, this instrument will add some noise to it and some gain to it, right? So we have to, so in, in your lab, whenever you do a certain, any experiment, there is always a very crucial aspect of your measurement is calibration, right? Calibration is nothing but removing the effect of uh, your instrument. In the case of astronomy, it is not just the instrument, but also the atmosphere, because it is traversing all these things. So it will also get modified. For example, in case of radio signals, it will be affected by ionosphere, actually, right? It will also be affected by all the receivers and uh, amplifiers and everything that they got, right? Awesome. So all those things will introduce certain effect. So that has to be removed. So this part is actually true for any experiment, right? But now there are certain other aspects which uh, become specific to because we have uh, uh, collected signal in a certain way here, which is that ideally, if this is how the source looks like, then if I take a full, make a Fourier transform of this, I'll get a visibility function, right? Which should be, it should be a continuous function, right? But it's a real source. They should not get uh, anything about it. But I am making measurements at certain discrete points there, right? Because that's all I can do. But I have finite number of antennas. Antennas have got certain finite separations. I, I cannot actually uh, sort of bring them closer beyond a certain point because they will start interfering with each other itself. So there's a physical limitation to it. And then uh, I, I will stop somewhere like, right? Uh, we will stop. We don't put antennas beyond that. Based on scientific interest, based on many things. I don't have any land beyond it. So real constraints uh, are in place, right? So what is happening here is that even though a visibility function itself is, is there, I, I'm sampling it at discrete points, right? So this SUV is the sampling function here. Hmm? So what is the sampling function? It's, it's a set of delta function. In our case, it's a 2D delta function, which means that uh, it is one at all these points where I have a uh, measurement and it's zero everywhere else, right? That's what this uh, is, this SUV is. So we call it sampling function, okay? And then my visit, what is my visibility? So the sample visibility that I have is part of these two, isn't it? Because this, this is my true visibility function, but I don't have access to it, right? I have only have measurements at these UK and VKs, right? So this is my sample visibility. So in short rotation, I can write this sample visibility as S and V, right? It's a product of these two, right? So now I have this and I have to take a Fourier transform of this, which is this, right? So now, if I want the image, if I do a Fourier transform of this, then what will be my image actually? In the image, I will have Fourier transform of this, Fourier transform of this, and the convolution of this. It is just following from the convolution. So what, what is happening here actually? What is happening here is that uh, this sampling function would have been unity if it was like sort of just an idealized thing, if I had complete access to the function, right? Uh, uh, visibility function, if I measure my visibility function uh, everywhere, then this would not exist. Then this is what we would have got, right? Fourier transform visibility is intensity, which is what my principal and theorem was, right? But now, because of the, the simple fact that I have actually discreetly sampled my visibilities, I have got this thing, right? <laughs> Fourier transform of the sampling function. So what is the Fourier transform of the sampling function? Fourier transform of the sampling function we refer to as the point spread function. Right? I'm jumping ahead and in my notation, instead of showing you something which is more meaningful, because it is self-explanatory. 
right? So this is, let us say, my image was. This is the image, right? If it, I would have measured visibility function accurately, right? So there are these sources in the sky, right? I don't know how well you can see it, but I suppose you can at least see that there are some sources there. One, two, three, four. These four brightness brightness sources you can see, right? So these are there, right? And this is what I would have gotten if my visibility function was ideally sampled. But it is not. So what has happened that this has now gotten converted with the Fourier transform of the sampling function, which is nothing but the point spread function. We call this point fun spread function be simply because the Fourier transform of this, let's say if it, this was a Gaussian, the Fourier transform of this will also be a Gaussian. Fourier transform of this was like a box function, it would be same function. So it's exactly the effort, the way I work it in optics, right? So this is literally the point spread function that you can encounter uh, if, if I was uh, imaging uh, with an optical wavelength, and this was my, this is the lens that I had access to, right? It lens layouts to mark the level block curvy, right? This is that crappy lens would be. So this is the Fourier transform corresponding to <coughs> The sampling function, just the Fourier transform of this, or this, or this, whatever that observation. So for each observation, we can actually, <clears throat> because I know where I did make the measurements, right? This is accurately known to me. <clears throat> and I can take the exact Fourier transform of it, and that would give me the point spread function. So I know point spread function very well uh, in radio observations. For each observation, we estimate it. And then it is convolved with this, right? So this actually you take and then, so each source which was just like this is now appearing like this because it is convolved with this point spread function, right? You see, convolved means that it, it is now look, representing this as well, right? And this, this you would have seen it in actually your uh, optical images also. You often see these stars have got these spikes, right? That's an extractor pattern coming here. So wherever the brightest objects are, you see these spikes. So what happens in this point spread function, this convolution is directly scaled with the flux density of the source. So the, these spikes that are spokes that you're seeing here, these will be brighter for the bright uh, sources and for fainter sources, they will actually, they, want to say something? Sir, how do we get that original image? How do we know this is what we should be getting? In this case, it is a simulation and to sort of demonstrate that this is what would happen, actually. But I will, I will complete how we get the original image. This one is an example to demonstrate because in this case, this is already available. And I'm telling you that this is what happens to it and this is how it will look like. But this is what we, we will get, right? This is what we get, right? So now the challenge is that from this, so before getting into it, uh, so that kind of diffraction pattern being convolved with images, we, have, we see at other wavelengths also, right? And as I was saying that it, it, it is scaled with the, Brightness of the source, so fainter sources uh, will have spokes also. All the sources would have because convolution is convolved for each pixel is multiplied. But whatever that is very faint and buried under the noise, that corresponding to its effects will not be seen. Right? That's why in those images you see that the brightest stars will like have these spikes. It, it is exactly the same. So we have the same thing here in this case. And this image we call as dirty image, right? Because it has certain things which we wouldn't. I wanted to have. So what is the limitation of this? That it will lead to actually inaccurate measurements, right? For example, this source is there and this source is there and then these two nearby sources will have their side lobes, the diffraction pattern overlapping each other, right? So if I go and make a measurement of its flux density, it will be actually corrupted by the side lobes which are actually falling on top of it, right? And the side lobes will also have not only positives but will also have negatives, right? Diffraction pattern will be negative to that. Right. So it will have negatives also. So then uh, it actually affects uh, measurements, uh, not only of the flux densities, but also the sizes of the objects as well. Only, so, so how to correct for it? So in at radio astronomy, we don't leave images just like that, the way it is generally done at optical. <clears throat> what we do is that we carry out uh, uh, what a process, what is called cleaning. So that image is cleaning. Cleaning is the name of the algorithm which is used to remove this uh, effect of side loads. 
So what we are seeing, so, so there are two things that we can do to reduce the effects of the side loads, right? So one is uh, cleaning, which I will explain to you. But now can anyone of you tell me that even before cleaning, what is it that I can do to reduce the uh, effect of these side loads that I'm seeing? I can pose this question in two different ways. One is that we want to reduce the effect of these uh, uh, side loads. Another one is I can say that I want to improve the properties of point pad function that I have, right? So do you think I can improve the properties of the point spread function? Observations <coughs> have taken place. So I cannot now go back to the telescope. Right, because you could have said the asa karo, antenna guma do, karo, right? No, all that is not possible. Right, observations have taken place. So now, can I? What can I do to actually improve the properties of the point spread function? So cleaning is to remove the side loads that are part of the point spread function, right? But let's say if I have a point spread function, we do not have those side loads. Then I don't even have to do cleaning, right? So wouldn't it be actually? Should we do anything that we can to actually make the point spread function as nice as possible? So, what is it that we can do? Yeah, so that's the question. No, point spread function is corresponding to the entire sampling pattern. This whole thing is corresponding to one point spread function, right? This will correspond to another point spread function for whatever observation this corresponds to. So we, when we, we are talking about point spread function, we are not talking about actually one point there, one point there, like that, right? Because you recall this, we are talking about an integral of all the modes that I have measured, right? So here also this thing is like a whole thing. Basically what I'm trying to say, when we are thinking about Fourier transform, one point in one domain corresponds to all the other points in another domain. Right, so if you remove this point, it will do something to the whole image. Right, not to just one. So the same uh, issues that were actually affecting the properties, imaging property of uh, uh, a lens or a dish would work here actually because they are all governed by the same fundamental aspects, right? actually, right? So there is, we can see that actually I have sampled very densely here, then it falls off and then it abruptly goes to zero, right? So my the ringing that I am getting in side note is because it is actually uh, abruptly falling to zero, isn't it? So what I can do is that I can, before taking the Fourier transform and making an image out of this, I can actually uh, apply a weighting function to this, right? And weighting function can be such that, that instead of falling it abruptly here, it can actually fall more smoothly here, right? So. Think of it like by some means I can try to make it look like a Gaussian, right? Then what would happen that corresponding point spread function will not have this. It will sort of just nicely fall off to zero. But what will be the, if I do that, what would be, what is that I'm sacrificing in the data? Because nothing comes from free, right? That is, that is the most important thing to learn in data analysis. That you try to optimize something, it is always at the cost of something else. That's very good, but why do you think resolution is getting compromised? Yeah, because we are giving lower weightage to the these uh, longer baseline which are responsible for giving me the resolution. One more thing, that is even more fundamental than that. If I say sensitivity is correct or wrong, I'm going to ask why, so you have to think. See, if I'm, uh, see the maximum sensitivity from uh, the collected data is achieved when you give all the data points 
same way. Weight of one. Like if the moment you try to give anything less than one, you are not using that data completely, right? So sensitivity is also affected, right? So this, so superficially actually, it is say that we should not do this. Sensitivity is going, resolution is going. These two things were made for a telescope. It's not easy to do, right? And now you are saying that after collecting the data, we are going to actually you know the weighting. But but an image. But we are here after making accurate measurements, right? Not just the beautiful images. Right? That's one thing to remember. So we will actually modify, multiply this data with a weighting function. So something. So what would happen is that. In this expression, in addition to delta, you can also put W, U, K, K, and that can be a complex function like anything that we can use that would produce uh, nicely Gaussian-looking kind of a sampling function, so that the Fourier transform is actually is better, right? So we, we will insert that uh, weighting function here, so that the so uh, one very nice thing uh, uh, compared to imaging and other wavelengths that you will notice. So introducing this weighting function is equivalent to modifying the property of the lens that is being used for imaging, isn't it? So in case of an optical telescope, you make the lens and the lens is fixed, right? It's imaging property, everything is fixed. In the image interferometer, the digital thing is that you can be sitting at your computer and decide like, okay, I want to now make an image which has actually more sensitivity to extended structures in the sky. And I am not really interested in the finer details because my goal of the project that I am carrying out is to measure the total flux that density of this galaxy. So then, what we would do is that we okay, let us make an image in which actually uh, shorter baselines have got larger weight compared to the longer baselines because the shorter ones are actually more sensitive to the extended structure in the sky, right? So make an image. So you can change the property of the lens. So your lens would be such that actually the, all the points here at the center have very nice weight, and then it actually falls off very rapidly, right? Very rapidly in the sense like to make it a equivalent Gaussian kind of a thing. That when you will throw away a lot of data, which is out the outer view, right? And 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 you will get a very nice image and accurate measure of that. Another thing you can say that you okay, know I am interested only in the Getting a nice resolution of the point sources which are there because I know that there are all these galaxies which are unresolved anyway because they are far away, so there is no information in the structure as such. But I want good resolution because they are sort of well separated from each other because otherwise they will get blended if the resolution is poor and everything. So then you can choose a weighting function which actually uh, sort of more like a uniform kind of uh, weighting across there, right? So it, it will you will suppress the weightage for the Central points, right? Because otherwise, your weighting, uh, your point spread function. So, what happens that if you have a lot of data points here, the central region, and much sparse sampling here, so you can think of it like from the linearity of Fourier transform, the Fourier transform of the central thing will be like this, right? And the Fourier transform of the outer one, let's say these were distribution of two Gaussians, this and this, right? And then this one will correspond to this, right? So, the resultant point spread function will be like this. Right, it's such a, uh, I mean, terrible point spread function. But most of the time, this is what we can get actually in the real thing. So the goal is to sort of decide, okay, okay I am interested in these kind of scales. So give me a point spread function which is like so you weight it like this. You give good weight to these and you suppress these, then we get a nice point spread function. This could be the you will be able to make measurements corresponding to the structure that you are. Interested in so you can actually at radio wavelengths continue keep modify the properties of the lens that you're using to make the image as you wish, whenever you wish actually. Even ten years after taking the data, if someone has taken the data, you think that you that person was interested in something else. Now I want to do something else. Change the weighting. Your image is different after that, right? So that is something which we always do actually, right? Because it is always good to start with a reasonable point spread function, right? But whatever we do, we cannot reduce the effect of cyclones to zero. So then we, on top of it, apply an algorithm called cleaning, and it's uh, the process is called deconvolution because the goal here is to actually remove the effect of uh, the cyclones that are coming from the point spread function, 
uh, in these four panels, what we are seeing is the how the points fed function is getting modified as I am giving different weightings with, to the data. What we were talking about, right? Here, a certain weighting has been given so that the shorter baselines have much higher weight. So you can see the resolution is compromised, but the side loads are reduced. And in this case, you can see that the side loads are like are extended. You can even confuse that this is also a source, right? But where this is not a source, it is actually another side peak. In the point spread function only, so this is this peak is corresponding to this source, but it is appearing like sources here, right? So this this is what we can remove. So once we have decided actually what is it that weighting we want to use, then we can after that apply the cleaning algorithm, and in that case the steps would go as following: determine the point spread function, you know exactly what it would be corresponding to the, a given set of weighting and sampling function. And what we do is that we find the brightest pixel in the image, and then we subtract uh, it from that image, uh, but not completely, but a scaled version of the point spread function corresponding to this. Right? Because we know, so we can subtract the entire thing from the image, and then we can repeat this process on the residual image. The, for example, I say I had a source here. If, if you go back to this. Uh, Image, then I can this may this let's say this is a brighter source. First, I will do this, then next, I will come here, then next, then I can come here, then I can come here, right? Like that, I can do it iteratively, and then finally, uh, one would uh, end up with an image which would uh, to a large extent will look like this, <coughs> right? Because I have removed uh, my team in the effect of the side loads. So so this is what we have been talking about, right? This that the aperture that we synthesize it gives us this excellent resolution corresponding to the longest baseline, but it is not perfect, right? So it has holes, it has missing information. All those things are there. So then they introduce side loads, and this is what we correct for uh, in the image. Actually, right? I am going to right now move to. So this is like if everything. If Somehow I got the visibilities, the corresponding to the intensity distribution in the sky. I can do that and I can make an image now, and I can even remove the effect of actually the uh, the side loads. But as I was talking about, the observed visibilities that we get are not true visibilities, right? What we need to do is actually to do calibration, right? So in any in a very general sense, actually, when you are doing experiments in your lab as well. Uh, the quantity that you are measuring, the quantity, is modified by the gain of the system. Right? This is your output. So this is what this simple equation represents. In this case, what is happening that my visibilities are caused from antenna pairs, right? So I in here have those antenna pairs, and it's a complex visibility. This means that I need to calculate both amplitude and phase part of it, right? So how do we do calibration, by the way? Or what is the if let's say you are doing an experiment and you have to do calibration, how will you do calibration? Exactly. Hmm? Ah, exactly. This is how it is done here as well, right? But you have to observe a source such that you can calibrate both amplitude and phase. We'll talk some some of these things a little more when we do the Hands on in the afternoon. So, image analysis. So, we have been talking about we take the sampling function, we measure it, we have more that we carry out the uh, we transform and that gives the image, right? So, but let us see how important, how many clear components do we need really to actually make an image. So, now I will go show you some examples from the simple image processing that is the previous one. Some of these examples are like very, uh, 70, 80 years old also. Very initial development of signal processing. You will find them in very old books as well. So you, you have an image, right? It's a like a it's an industrial uh, setup here. You have an image here left. You take a Fourier transform of this, you will get this. You can use Python and write and carry out this Fourier transform uh, like this. And then uh, what we do is that we say that we, okay, I'm going to uh, just take top twelve percent uh, components. And throw away the rest, and I take a Fourier transform. It still looks like pretty much what we had. 
right? And then if you say that you know, even 12 percent, then it is still too much, right? Let's just take five percent of it. Even then, you will say that some sampling things are reduced, but still resemblance is still very good. Only few components are required. Few dominant, prominent components are required, right? To make the measurements. So if now if you think of it that we play, we are giving weightage, throwing away data. In that, right? So it's, it's so we have a lot of uh, we have lots of degrees of freedom to actually play around there. This is what uh, I want to impress upon by showing this. Another thing is that let us say we take this. This is an image of a uh, clock, and if uh, and and I, we have an amplitude of it, and we have a phase of it. Right? So what we do is that we take the phase term and randomize it in one set, right? And in another set, what we do is that we but leave the amplitude intact. In the second example, we would actually uh, randomize and uh, and keep the phase intact. So the top one is where we have randomized amplitude and kept the phase intact. So you can see that we can still tell that it looks like clock. In the bottom one, actually, what we have done is that we have randomized uh, phase and kept the amplitude intact. Nothing is left here, right? So what this tells you is that on image reconstruction, of course, you want both amplitude and phase, but phase is more important, right? This is another example. Like left is a clock, right is a city, and then what we do is that uh, in this case we uh, swap the we take phases of this. And apply to here, phase of this and apply to there, right? And keep the amplitude as same. And what one finds that the output actually then corresponds to uh, uh, the image from where the phase term actually came from, right? So what this is again showing is that for image reconstruction, what does amplitude represent is the magnitude of the spatial frequency, the Fourier mode that we are uh, looking at. But phase is actually its location, right? Just a, I got I tell you 10 milligens is its amplitude, but where does it go in that image? That information comes from the phase, right? So the how your uh, energy is distributed is actually comes from the phase. So, so if you're interested in imaging, phase is what you have to treat it much more carefully, right? So in interferometer. Calibration. What what is happening? That let's say we have these ES and EY as uh, electric vectors. They are now getting modified, right, by propagation. And this propagation we can represent by a 2D matrix, and these are called as Jones matrices. It's a nomenclature which comes from optics, right? Uh, so so, a, so what we can do is that we, we know that the radiation that I'm uh, oh, Collecting is getting modified by various propagation effects. For example, it will go through electronics of a telescope, it will go through the ionosphere for sure, then all these will be associated with a different physical effect, right? And then that physical effect will modify the signal in a different way, right? We can actually uh, determine from uh, actual physics or geometry, right? So we can what we can do is that we can have a sequence of Jones matrices corresponding to each effect. And then use that to recover the true measurement. So these are some examples, right? So this is like K Jones matrix. This is just a simple propagation effect. This is P Jones is a parametric angle. The simple fact that as I'm observing the telescope is rotating uh, in the plane of the sky, right? So then F Jones is corresponding to the Faraday rotation part of it, right? That the uh, two rotation modes develop a phase uh, lag between them. Then G zones are the receiver gains, right? So these are the ones which we can. So this one, so some of these can actually be determined directly by just uh, uh, geometric, right? And G something like G zones, for example, uh, or parallel rotation. These ones actually, we, for these we will have to observe a standard form. So G one and G J, for example, in this case are complex uh, terms. So it has an amplitude and phase term as well. So I can write it as a. Into exponential and pi terms. This is how it will be, and this is how this will be. And i and j are corresponding to the two different uh, elements that we have, and so on. So, like these, 
So, so using these Jones matrices, we can have a complete uh, description of what is the propagation path of the signal, and, and, and these can then be observed uh, or, or, or determined, uh, and then applied to the visibility. So this is what uh, what uh, what happens. So let's say if, if I have these uh, visibilities, so this is what is called as the standard uh, measurement equation. So this is my true visibility. And then these are the Jones matrices, JP and JP is the JP being the complex conjugate to it, and then this is how I am actually uh, getting the my observed visibility. So calibration is essentially determining what these Jones matrices are. Once we know the Jones matrices, then we can actually recover from that the true visibility, and then how how this sol uh, solution. Is obtained. Uh, this is actually now optimized using set of linear algebra because you can see from this, this is just a set of matrices right now on both sides. So what we need to do is to solve for these matrices, solve these matrices for uh, actually uh, a set of uh, antenna-based gains. Right? Each antenna will have a gain. Right? If I, if I go back. Yeah, so like this. So each antenna will have a gain as a function of time. And if I am observing, opening this data at different frequencies, then it will also become a function of frequency in that case. But that can also be uh, separated out as a different matrix. So, so this is a these are the set of equations that I get. So if I observe a known signal, then I have a set of equations which I need to solve. Right. So to give you an example, let's say in case of GMRT, let's say if I have 30 antennas. So then I will have 30 C2 combinations at a certain instance, and I observe a certain source which I know that it's one gen C and it's a point source. So now I and what I want to do is that I want to measure what will be the gains corresponding to each antenna at that instance, right? So I will have a set of these uh, linear homogeneous equations which I can solve simultaneously, and that will tell me what are the gains of the antenna. So this is what I meant that these can then be actually solved for and optimized using. Linear algebra. Right, so that's another thing that uh, out of linear algebra, then you know that this is not this is very useful. So one of the challenges that happens uh, with the current set of telescopes is that we calculate, uh, we, we collect actually large amounts of data. So enormous compute power is needed. Like most of the data that we are collecting uh, last several years is actually cannot be processed on laptop. We have to almost all the time uh, have, have it on some HPC uh, facility. To give you an example, that the Mika telescope, which uh, I use uh, quite a lot nowadays, it has got 64 antennas, it has 856 megahertz bandwidth, and it's instantaneous, and then it has got 32 K frequency channels, right? So, in one terabyte, it actually leads to, uh, sorry, in one hour, it actually gives one terabyte of data, right? So, that's and, and typical observation is actually generally few hours at least, right? So you get few terabytes just like that. And so you want to read that data can take on to disk can take two hours. So and and if you want you you when we run it on cluster, it, the calibration imaging of it can take just one day, um, one full day just for one data set actually. So if you're carrying out a large survey set of observations, then this thing can actually become very uh, Intensive, like data intensive, right? So that's uh, another thing to, and, and in radio astronomy is more data intensive. Right? So, up to this point, I've been telling you that actually the dipoles uh, can, uh, like, are not so good. So, let's move into dishes and be very even interferometry using dishes. But uh, when you go to low frequencies, uh, array of dipoles can actually be very useful. Right? One thing that they can be actually used to. Form multiple beams, right? And also these beams then can be actually electronically steered in different directions. So I so I'm anticipating that Avinash Deshpande, when he talks about time domain astronomy, a pulsar, he would actually be talking a bit more about uh, dipoles. And then, then at lower frequency, it becomes very optimal to use dipoles as the basic element and not so much as the dishes. So when we will look at telescopes, uh, when we look at telescopes at Frequencies like the 200 megahertz or so, uh, you would find that the telescopes such as LOFAR, for example, or Millurable White Field in Australia, they are nothing but just a set of dipoles which are 
which have been arranged in the middle of uh, them. And uh, so different, so, so in, in, to keep things simple, actually, I sort of pushed us in the direction of dishes and clarify certain concepts, but uh, it is very much, uh, the general conclusion should, should be that different receptors and technologies are used at different wavelengths. And depending on what frequency we are, how the scope is going to operate, we have to pick the optimal technology. And calibration imaging recipes are also become different. Why is that? Because I told you that these propagation effects can be actually encapsulated in these different zones matrices. And if we go back to our, some of the very earliest slides, then I told you that very highest frequency it is the copospheric absorption that is important. And the low, as, and as you come towards the lower frequencies, then it is the ionospheric effect that becomes important, right? So you can see that like the the data will get affected uh, just through the, our atmosphere differently depending on what frequency I am observing, right? At what time of the day I am observing and things like that, right? So atmosphere, for example, is much more prevalent uh, during solar maxima and also at the time of equinoxes and all right? So calibration imaging recipes also become different. But good thing is that the, all these basic concepts remain same, not just across radio wavelength, but anything that you Related to imaging and calibration, right? And anything that we have talked about, uh, like you remove the word radio and the statements are the concepts are still still hold actually. Like just be careful of the context that is there. So I just showed a couple of slides related to star kilometer array. So uh, uh, star kilometer array is the next generation telescope. It's like become so large that it's something cannot be built by a single country. So it's an international consortium in which India is also involved and it will actually consist of two uh, components. Uh, it's low frequency components, which is as well 300 megahertz will be set up in Australia and it's a uh, mid frequency component, uh, which will cover gigahertz uh, frequencies, it will be set up in South Africa. So that's where I said like the mid cap will actually uh, sort of is, is an, is an SKP for mid frequency component and it will get uh, incorporated into it over the next few years. So this is an idea of how SK made when it is there, it will look like. So there are all these dishes, you can see that they are offset Gregorian. So SK phase one will have like 200 dishes. And then it will go to like, I think 2000 dishes. Right? Uh, it's 13.5 meter diameter. The large field of will be there and the resolution will come from the long baselines. And this is how the low component in Australia will look like. You can see that it is like a set of uh, dipoles which are laid out like set of dipoles. So these are called stations. So the signal from these dipoles will be combined and then these station signals will be then combined up like that. So different frequencies, different signs and this is different technology, different data processing strategy. So this is just uh, giving some comparison uh, between like how the imaging will be improved with SK and it comes, you can see that they will become much more sharper, much cheaper. So this is more for public uh, consumption. So it's at a very high level, but uh, SK will actually, uh, will make a fundamental uh, discoveries in all the fields that if it has like starting from galaxy evolution, cosmology and dark energy and Test of gravity and origin and evolution of cosmic magnetism, like by observing poor vibration from radio sources. This is something which is very, very unique to radio astronomy. And also, the galaxy evolution part is very, especially the early universes, looking for signals from neutral hydrogen, very early epochs, like epoch of realization experiments, which is the probing the cosmic group down, and then looking for uh, signatures of uh, life in other uh, planets, right? So, the scale and complexity of this telescope is going to be so much that it's uh, reasonable to not build it in one single step. It has been built in parts, which means that like the community over the last 10, 15 years have built what is called precursor telescopes, uh, which has been built at South Africa and uh, other concept uh, telescope in Australia and also the other pathfinder telescopes across the world, which actually uh, all of them are uh, testing a particular uh, aspect of technology or even science actually that will be 
uh, done with uh, required for the SK, and then all of this will be then put together. And even SK is built, will be built in two parts. First, it will be SK phase one, and then it will be the full SK. SK phase one will be have ten percent of the sensitivity of. SK. So, what will be the frequency range of this SK? So, it will, uh, so the low component will be covering less than 300 megahertz, go down to I think 30 megahertz or so. And then, uh, like the mid frequency component will cover at 300 megahertz and then up to probably 30 or 40 megahertz. I, I forget the exact number. So that's what will be. But we don't go much higher than that because for much higher frequencies, one of the community already has ALMA, which operates at frequencies more than 85 gigahertz. So like it is considered as like uh, one of the most powerful telescope. SK. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. In, in at this frequency, it will be the most sensitive. Currently, the most sensitive at centimeter wavelengths is mean cap. And then in few years, when SK phase one it comes, it will be the most sensitive. And then when SK comes and so SK is going to continue to be the most sensitive comes online. I think how much time will it take to be operational? So uh, yeah, so uh, I think current schedule indicates that around 26 or 27, there will be actually some parts of dishes that will be available for uh, taking a set of data. So towards the end of this decade, uh, one expects that one will start getting data from like. Uh, the fully operational telescope. So how is India contributing? Hmm? How is India contributing? So India is uh, developed what is called telescope manager uh, for this uh, uh, for SK telescope because like you can see that like it involves so many components, uh, these so many dishes and everything. So one of the important aspects of uh, operating telescope is to like sort of uh, know that how to set it up to observe a certain part of the sky and all those things. Right? So, telescope manager will be responsible for uh, that. So, India is uh, so Indian uh, researchers, along with the industry in India, are actually developing telescope manager for this thing. for both uh, high and low, mid and low. So, like it is also called the big data project to SKs. So, like how much it will co uh, cost to for building this telescope? Cost actually, uh, I think it is. I, I, I don't remember the cost part of it, and I don't know to say it online, especially the <laughs> money aspect, finance aspect of it. You can talk about it during the hands on part of it, but uh, see, the big data thing uh, is, is, of course, SK will be the biggest data machine. Uh, like, I think that in, in this, this one day one's output will be equal to the entire uh, internet uh, put. World, for the whole world actually, that's what it will be. So, uh, but then there are, I mean, astronomy in general is becoming very data intensive. For example, if you look at LSST, uh, which will be like an optical, will be an optical telescope, it will also be very, produce a lot of uh, huge amounts of data. ALMA is producing lots of data. MIRCAD, BLA, all these telescopes are already producing huge amounts of data. The parent super community and efficiency is uh, like level for the amount of data generated, or that could also require. No, so so there's a lot of uh, development uh, taking place uh, in setting up the uh, computing facilities to meet that requirement. But even, even if we set up like reasonably big data centers, even that will not be sufficient. So in parallel, a lot of work is also happening on the algorithm front to make all those algorithms much more efficient and some of and, and maybe try to see that by running it on some specialized hardware can we improve their efficiency for example some some of the imaging can go on to things like gpu for example and that can then become efficient so we, we, one cannot meet that requir projected requirements of sk just by you know brute force uh, placement of hardware one will also have to do a lot of work in uh, improving the software and algorithms that are there to do that. Without that, it will not happen.
These are some of so whatever we have talked about today. So these are some of the uh, textbooks you can look at. So for Fourier transforms, and there is nothing better than Bracewell. Like that. For optics, well, such as Janicke theorem, everything bond and wool, astrophysical techniques, in general, is teaching tools of radio astronomy. You can look at rocks and there's various other books. And then for tools of radio, I mean, radio astronomy specifically, then is number five and number six actually. Give information on the different aspects. Right? So these are the six folks. And of course, as you are interested, they're more interested in Fourier optics and all, then there are lots of books on that as well. So now let us take some questions and let's discuss whatever we have done up to this point. Then <coughs> if you are there, we can also take uh, questions from online participants. Yeah. So I request uh, all online participants, please raise your hand if you have any doubt or questions. I'm stopping to share my screen because then it will be easier for me to. And the zoom. Subrata. Yeah, you can unmute yourself. So, Brata, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah uh, there was uh, one of the previous slides where um, you uh, defined the um, sample function and the uh, visibility function, S. S of UK, VK, and V of UK, VK, right? Uh, so I was just wondering what you, uh, S of the, uh, UK, VK is just uh, a set of delta functions, uh, yes. chronic argument. And the yes. v, v is what? Is the is the intensities at those uh, coordinates UK, VK? Or? No, it's V is the visibility. Oh, it's the visibility. visibility, which is amplitude and pace. Uh, right, right. Uh, the visibility as defined by that Michelson formula? Uh, not not really. Actually, the concept, conceptually, it's the same in the sense of the fringe. It is relationship to the fringe, but it is visibility is just the two point uh, uh, correlation function that we measured corresponding to an antenna pair, right? Okay. Okay. Um, but my Michelson thing is for the addition of parameters IMX minus I mean IMX plus I mean. Correct, so correct. There is what we are talking about is like at the in, in, in radio interparameter we are sampling the uh, amplitude and phase both. So visibility is corresponding to that for the antenna, any antenna. Pair. And wherever that measurement is made, the uh, sampling function is unity and everywhere else it is. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, I still didn't get how do we get that original image. The one you said what your was one simulation. So this this one you're referring to, right? <coughs> this one. Uh. So, so, this is what we will get if we make it, do interferometry and make an image, right? We wouldn't know what is this. So, how do we then? Ah, so, to, to get this, we will have to actually do, as I said, deconvolution. And we do deconvolution because this, what is this image? This image is actually uh, the two sky uh, convolved with the point spread function. So if you remove the effect of the point spread function, I will get the two properties of this first two image. So if I, if I want to go from this to this, then I have to do the convolution. This is a clean algorithm. 
Let's look at this. Uh, like when pulsars was discovered, that uh, before when uh, uh, supernova was also observed in the Earth. So, like they are interconnected. It was supernova when zero pulsars was observed, and after that, pulsars was discovered. So, like uh, there is some interconnection between them. Sometimes, like because the neutron star is what you mean, right? When it has neutron star. So, I do not know what to do the time lapse between the two. But in that sense, there can be a relation between them. Like after a year, like 1968, the uh, Pulsars was discovered. I do not know about that specifically. Uh, we ask Avinash tomorrow, he will talk about Pulsars. He will know. And so, one more thing I want to ask uh, like, how radio astronomers interpret the radio waves? So, like, we are getting some specific data. Or uh, so we use radio telescopes. That is the only way we can actually say anything about radio waves. So, and and that's what we have been talking about today. We can have, for example, single dish telescopes or dipoles used as detectors to detect those radio waves. Or we can do radio interferometry as well if we want to make images at a higher spatial resolution. And then using them only, we can detect radio waves and say anything about them. There is no other way. So these are EM waves, right? And we cannot detect, I mean, we have to detect them first. So that's what radio telescopes do. I mean, just like if you want to make, we are also receiving EM waves at optical wavelengths, right? But we cannot uh, just, uh, we can only see the brightest of them in the sky, but our eyes are not sensitive to radio waves, but they are sensitive to optical. So we can see brightest objects in the sky. So we can infer them directly by looking at them, looking at the sky, right? But if we want to look at fainter objects, we have to still use telescope even at optical wavelengths. But our eyes cannot uh, detect signal at radio wavelengths. So we have to completely rely on the radio wave, a radio telescope for it. I mean, is there something else at, uh, because we are closing in a few minutes. Yeah. I guess there are no questions online. Okay. So, uh, so why is optical Because of very high frequency, actually. <coughs> you need to uh, send. If you want to do interferometry, we need to sam uh, sample both amplitude and phase, right? Not just the amplitude. As I was explaining, that it's like phase is uh, which has contains information related to how the power is distributed. So at optical, it becomes very, very hard to set up uh, the kind of precision that will require the sampling rate that we, that we, uh, we need to sample it. That's why it becomes like very, very, very difficult. That's why, like, it has not progressed as much as it is. The infirmity has had much lower frequencies. So, because since we can sample it directly, we can do, we can straight away get the multiplicative term. <clears throat> we don't have to do the addition in the parameter. So that means I'm disconnecting from Zoom. Yeah, sure. And we can spend a few more minutes if there are some questions. We are meeting in the afternoon.
Now, most of the times uh, we are actually looking at unknown signals. So there are two sets of observations that people do. One is that they would do blind searches of certain types of objects in the sky, for which like they will be just scanning different parts of the sky. Another thing is that an object is known from some observation at some other wavelength, something discovered at X-ray or ultraviolet, like some galaxies observed uh, known at optical wavelength.